be sitting down and chatting with you today. When we crossed paths in, in some of our mutual networking groups, I knew that, uh, you know, the conversations we were having would be awesome if shared with a, with a broader audience. Um, so welcome. Glad, glad to sit down and talk with you. Thanks, Tom. I'm thrilled to be here. And I really look forward to this topic because I don't think we get into it enough. I think most people are just putting fake ass shit on on social media. And it we it's time for us to to get real about what we've been through and to use it to to use it as it, because it's there for a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I'm sure in your coaching, you know, as you come across, you know, individuals, organizations, um, you can't help. And I know from our interactions, you're, you're willing to help people dive into some of those hard, challenging, you know, sometimes the parts that feel yucky um, and really, you know, use those as a foundation to build upon. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to just sort of sort of set that up. How did you come to this space? Did you, you know, just have this, you know, flash of insight one day where you saw the value in diving into pain as a coach or was it out of your pain? I'd love to hear a little bit of just the backstory of what got you to this point where you're like, wow, this is a really powerful thing to, to transform for people. Well, you know, I think everything is an evolution, Tom, and I know that I've been on an evolution of healing, basically, and my business is one of the ways that it outpictures actually in the world. And I certainly went through childhood trauma. I went through abuse, physical abuse and sexual abuse. And it's only in the last few years that I've become really comfortable talking about that and being real about it. Uh, because, you know, obviously I don't, I want people to hear this. I don't want sympathy. I'm not sharing that for sympathy. I'm sharing this because everything that I have become, everything that I've built has been shaped just as much by the trauma as it has by the great things. And in fact, more by the trauma because how are diamonds formed, you all? Diamonds are formed under pressure. We don't get anywhere when we're in comfort zone. And I'll tell you what, trauma immediately kicks you out of comfort zone. I love that. Yeah, it's so easy to get stuck in those spaces. And I appreciate your vulnerability in in diving into that because it is something that, you know, I know for me, for a large chunk of my life, that was the part that you kept sort of sealed away. Um, but if you come to it, you know, I know if you approach it with boldness, and I'm sure you can validate it, um, yeah. you can unlock and dive into it. And it's not always fun. It's never, you know, it's often not pretty, but it really gives you that that internal strength, really that grounding, right? Can you, is, is that something you've seen? Whereas you've helped people, uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen, you know, other, other coaches, you know, coach people to a place of greater stability and just, um, owning ownership of your past and kind of like, yes. you know, young talks about that dark side of us. Um, can you, is there anything where you've seen around that helping people own, you know, those parts? Absolutely. Of them that, you know, Every yeah. single person who sticks with me for the long term, either through going through all the levels of Reiki stress and pain relief, you know, going through all the levels, it's kind of like martial arts, it has levels. And I'm nice. actually called a Reiki master, by the way, Tom. Woo nice. <laughs> That's my title, right? Um, and also in my coaching, every single person who sticks with me is, is willing to excavate to excavate mm -hmm. who they are, mm -hmm. who they've been. And see, the thing is, we all have three parts of ourselves, right, Tom? We have the past. We have the past Barnsley. We have the past, Tom. We have the present one. And then we have the one we are becoming. And this is where I help people to not get stuck in the past one and not even in the present one, but to use both of those parts to fashion the future them, the future future you that you want to be the future you that is 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 it embodies the values and the stand on the planet that you want to embody and i'll tell yeah. you what if i had not had the experience i'll tell you what things have been honed in me just a few things that have been honed in me by the experiences i went through one is kindness and i don't take that lightly i was just talking with the creator of the kind and mind podcast yesterday and we were talking about how kindness is honed not through sympathy but through empathy and empathy comes from having an experience of being human and being helpless perhaps and I certainly felt helpless as a child to change anything I didn't know it could be changed 
And, you know, when people get into a, a, a very difficult relationship, what I like to call a relationship, Tom, <laughs> when people get into a difficult relationship, either pers uh, personally or professionally in business, for example, or with a boss who's toxic, guess what? They go through trauma. And mm -hmm. it's time for us to take that and turn it into compost. And one of the things created out of that compost, one of the good things that allows us to flourish and thrive is kindness. And the other thing I think is just humility. And some people would say, you, you know, I, and, and I'm not talking about being humble. I'm talking about humility, which is a very different thing. For me, hum, being humble is kind of a posture that somebody manipulates through. But humility is the real internal characteristic of just realizing, you know, we're all in, in the, a human form. We all have, as I believe, some spark of source inside of us. And we're all just trying to get through and do the best we can. Yeah, Even if yeah, we yeah. totally F up, we're just trying to do the best we can. I don't believe there's a single person, even Jeffrey Dahmer when he was alive, right, who didn't intend to do the best they could at the level of consciousness where they were. Yeah, yeah. No, and you and I share that interesting overlap where I've been studying um, martial arts and you know some internal aspects of martial arts for the past 15 years. So I know a little bit about Reiki. Um, my background is more in, you know, studying, you know, a little bit of Kung Fu, a little bit of karate. Yeah. Um, I'm in uh, Hapkido right now, but tell me a little bit about that, the embodied aspects, how can Reiki and sort of those exercises that bring us more into our body, whether it's, you know, Tai Chi mm -hmm. or just, you know, meditation. Um, tell me a little bit about, a bit about the physicality of, of, of trauma and getting through that. Cause I, I, love I know that. there's some really interesting elements there. There's some great books out there. The Body Keeps the Score is one of them. Yeah. And everything that happens to, and the work of Dr. Daniel Amen, a, spelled like amen, y'all who are listening, A-M-E-N, is amazing in helping us reset our vagus nerve. Because what happens when we undergo trauma is the vagus nerve, which actually communicates with the rest of the, the body from basically back here, um, it, it, gets, it gets stuck. So when people say, I feel stuck, it's actually a really apt description. Yes. Well, it's funny that in the stuck. combat arts, this triangle here, the vagus nerve cluster is what you strike because if you strike that, the lights go out, you know, it is functionally the nerve cluster that yeah. controls everything where it will literally exactly. turn off the body. It's command central. It's command central. Yeah. And think about it. If command central is sending out messages that are erroneous, like you're an imposter or you suck or you deserve to be hit or whatever it is um, that the, the neural pathways that are existing are, you know, in a shitty story. I keep saying shit a lot, Tom, forgive me for that, but I like to call them shitty stories. We all have them. We all have our stories about ourselves that, and there's nothing else that I like to call them because there's no way to make it pretty, but we have our stories about, about our identity that we tell ourselves that are self-sabotaging. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. when these become a neural pathway, right, and suddenly they call it in positive psychology, the downward spiral, it gets triggered and then off we go into this mm -hmm. um, neurochemical reaction. Well, guess what? Something's got to stop it. And that's where things like Reiki, like yoga, like Kung Fu, like meditation, um, all of these come in, even the very, even yawning, like everybody yawn right now, I'm yawn. Ooh, make you contagious. That is a way you can actually reset the vagal nerve by yawning. Um, and Dr. Amen has some wonderful YouTube videos, by the way, those of you who are listening, you can go and just look him up and which he works with people who've been all sorts, been in all sorts of traumas. They've been in the military, you know, all sorts of things. And he works with them. And that's one of the easiest ways that you can have a quick, quick reset. But for me, Reiki has been about embodiment um, because it's been about, for me, safe touch. It's been about taking care of myself because I have done Reiki on myself every single day since 1992, mm -hmm. 31 years. And that is why I've become who I am. I've studied many things, but Reiki has been the thing that has just been like brushing my teeth, having a shower, going to sleep, the things you do every day, eating your lunch. Reiki has been that much of a staple in my life. And I bring it into my coaching 
all the time, Tom, because I don't have to say right now I'm doing Reiki on us and I don't have to say, well, I'm doing Reiki on you. But what it creates is connection. It creates mm -hmm. connection and it's going out. It creates uh, it creates an awakening for people. It acknowledges in Reiki. There's this principle where we acknowledge the spark in you, the spark of source in you, whatever you'd like to call source, divine God, um, you know, whatever you would like to call it, the spark of source or just pure energy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's about embodying uh, truly being in our bodies instead of out of our bodies, which is what trauma does to us. That's what PTSD yeah. is. That's what disassociation is. All these terms that you hear in psycho psychology, they're about you being out of your body um, yeah. and not yeah. grounded in it. Does that answer your question? That was kind of a long answer. No, it totally does. No, that was a great, great answer. Um, just the power of embodiment. I was wondering yes. as you've worked through your own and then worked with a, a wide variety of clients, male, female, various ages, is there a common through line where if someone's listening to this and they're like, okay, Dr. Brown, where do I begin? Like, is there one, you know, if, is there one Jenga block in the tower, which if I pull this, it can start a really positive cascade where, you know, I'm tired of feeling disconnected from my body. I'm tired of, you know, falling into these same ruts, you know, that habitually, you know, I yeah. know cognitively don't take me to a good place in my relationships, right. in my career, in my family. Is there something where you could say, Hey, this one thing, um, can just dynamically shift a shift a situation. Yeah. They need to come work with me, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Absolutely. Well, let me just say, okay. All right. Now I say that somewhat facetiously, but what I mean you all is that we need to find someone who is where we want our future us to be. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the thing in being successful in business and being successful in life is about finding models who've actually gone where you want to go. They've made it over the hot coals. They've made it through the crocodile infested moat. And now they are at the, the castle, right? And they are going to make our journey so much easier, so much with so much less stress and frustration, uh, so much less cortisol, the stress hormone, you know, they're going to make it enjoyable. And we all need that support. And you know what, Tom, in my last online workshop, by the way, they can also come to a free workshop. I'll be sure to mention that. And they'll get a lot of a lot of value there just for free. And that's my gift to everyone. But you know, when we approach these things, we have to realize that what happens to lone wolves, lone wolves die, they starve. There's a reason there's a pack. And we all need a pack. And so I counted up recently, Tom, I counted up how many coaches and mentors who I've invested thousands of dollars in, by the way, how many I've had in the last, say, five, six years. And there are 16, 16 mm. coaches and mentors. And I would not be sitting here having this conversation with you without all of their support, their butt kicking of me, their... Uh, coddling of me at times and nurturance of me, um, I would not be here without all of those people. And no matter where we get in our businesses, there's always another level. And I call it a level in, not a level up. So we want to find somebody who's already at that level in and let them be our model. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is a fundamental truth that we rise or fall to the people, you know, to the level of those we surround ourselves with and just being really conscious yeah. about the communities in which we put ourselves, right. um, people who will, yeah, it's that, it's that fine dynamic of someone who will challenge us, but also love us, respect us, um, call us to be that higher evolution of, of who we are, you know, that will genuinely believe in us. Um, yeah. I mean, community is such a powerful tool and it's, it's in desperate need. I mean, you look at how disconnected we are and some of the habits we've gotten into, particularly, you know, post 2020 where, you know, it's, it is more, yes. common, you know, we're to be more isolated and more alone and it, you know, it might feel good to doom scroll or Netflix and chill, but deep down, you know, there is even the most 
introverted of us um you know community is good being around other people even if it's just you know sitting opposite someone and reading books together being in that proximity with another you know another another entity is just a presence powerful yeah just a presence a friend of mine said recently because we were talking about uh relationships and he said well you know your your animals Hmm. are if you didn't have your animals it would be more of an issue and i said yeah i totally agree all these pets that we have, all these rescue animals we have, they are my oxytocin hits, you know? Yeah. They're my they keep me busy and they they give me love as well as my daughter, but I just don't feel the need really for that intimate relationship. And some of you listening may may maybe there's a reason this is coming up, but you know, forms of connection are as possible as all the terms that the Greeks had for love, you know? They had eros, romantic love. They had agape, the love of uh, God. They had philia, the love of a brother and a sister. And then they had three others. They understood, but we lump it all together in this one word. And that is really a gross simplification. It's a lot, it's a lot of weight for one word to carry. It's, it's way too much weight. And so when we talk about, I like the word connection with community since you brought up the word community tom and it really is important and i will just say recently you all i decided i had been tuning in on zoom to my spiritual community and recently i really said i don't care how late i've stayed up the night before i don't care how much i may want to to sleep in i'm going and then i started participating in what we call a deeper dive afterwards where we talk about what was shared by the speaker. And then uh, I started participating in some of the other things, but doing it in person. And I want to say to everybody, you know, I know we're a little shell shocked, but it's time for us to get back to in person, not just in our spiritual communities, but also in our business endeavors. So not just the networking online, but get back to the networking in person in your local area, you know, carefully chosen networking groups that are in alignment that have your target audience, your talk target ideal avatar. You know, Tom, I'm thinking about something interesting since you bought brought up embodiment and before I want to, I want to call, call us back to that for a second too. Um, So going in person certainly is a way to, to experience embodiment with other people and to experience the energy of other people very palpably in a way that we don't necessarily experience it on zoom. You know, it, it's yeah. especially for people who are kinesthetic being there in person. I can mm-hmm. get so much more from someone just being in close proximity, um, as yeah. you point out. But, you know, let's think about embodiment in terms of our brands, because we wanted to mm-hmm. talk about a resonant brand. And I want to suggest to everyone that all of these things that have happened to you, these these thoughts you've had, these experiences that you've had, all of this is in service to you actually being an embodiment of something on the planet, which I call your stand, your stand. Yeah, yeah. What is your stand on the planet? So one of my stands on the planet is the basically my foundational stand is that every voice matters. Every mm-hmm. voice matters. You matter what you have to give the world matters and you're the only one who can give it you yeah, matter yeah. and you can see that that stand very clearly came out of me not feeling that i mattered much as a kid and so i want to suggest to you that you find your stand you find your purpose you find your foundational values and the value you provide to the world by looking at what was put on your plate, what you came into in this, in this lifetime, what you came into as your journey. Yeah. Yeah. No, you touched upon something that I'm super, yeah. Super passionate about is yeah. How do you build a brand personal brand and brand is a big, big, big word. I mean, it is, it's it's huge, but really it's functionally all the ways you can be perceived. And as a coach, you know, you you're perceived through your website, through your live events, through your recorded events, you know, people experiencing this either live or after the fact, you know, will get a glimpse of your personal brand, my personal brand. We're creating something at the overlap there, but yeah, absolutely tapping into your backstory, and then using that to distill your values and, you know, functionally your values are just the, the things you value, the things you devote time, talents and treasure to. 
Um, and if you, Tom, you and I are on the same wavelength. You know what came to me right before we got on here? It was exactly that that phrase: time, talent, and treasure. You know, it's yeah, our resources. And it's and if you're able to pursue those, you know, that uh, it it puts you in a really nice state of integrity, where internally what you're creating in the world is, is balanced and, you know, tied into who you genuinely are, you know, what you believe, the type of world you believe, you know, should, should exist. Um, one of the things when I'm helping organizations could be, you know, large corporation could be, you know, small startup. You know, one of the first things we talk about is let's list out values. Let's pick five words, you know, and we're going to stack rank them. You only get five or, or fewer, but these are the things that are non-negotiable. You know, if you pivot, if you launch a new product line, if you, you know, shift five years down the road, these are the, these are the foundational elements that will always be true. And they guide everything from the words and messages you put out into the marketplace. They guide the fellow travelers that you draw into your ecosystem. They'll guide your hiring practices because you'll be able to, you know, check those against the people you're bringing into your orbit, your your future employees, your future contractors. Um, and I know for me, it's been just a really nice way to, you know, acting out of integrity is just such a it's such a deeply rewarding place to manifest the world that you genuinely believe should exist. Um, I mean, there's really nothing like it. You know what, it, for those people who haven't heard of it, I think human design is a very interesting system. There's a system mm-hmm. called human design and you can you can Google it and you can find out what your design is. And I'm called a manifest generator. And so mm-hmm. for manifest generators, we really do make gut decisions. I know, Tom, in my gut, if something's a yes or a no. You could ask me, you know, something and I would know yes or no. It would just be Mm. so clear to me. And that's how I make decisions. And when I go against that that embodied knowledge, that embodied wisdom, that embody, you could call it wisdom, that embodied awareness, when I go against it, that's when I have issues in business. Mm. That's when I have issues Mm. in my life. So I want to say to everybody, you know, when we're talking about branding, A lot of times people think of it in a very superficial way. You know, they'll say, oh, you know, the Nike, just do it. Oh, that's Nike. Or the little, the little swoosh. Oh, that's Nike. Or, oh, there's the Wendy's girl. Oh, that's Wendy's, (laughs) right? Those are the colors. And the reality is that those have all been strategically chosen by those companies based on those values. But how it plays out with the people I work with, Tom, because I work generally with solopreneurs or people who have uh, maybe 50 or less employees, right? This is my sweet spot. These are the folks I love working with and bringing them you know, into six figures and multiple six figures and beyond. For us, it becomes very much about what are your highest values in the world? And so for, for me, fun, spirituality, family of choice, kindness. Those are some of them. Lifelong learning. That's a fifth. Sometimes I call it creativity, but it's, it's lifelong learning or creativity, depending on my mood. Then the question is, well, how do I bring that into every, that internal uh, locus of values? How do I bring Mm -hmm. that into how I present myself? So interestingly today, I realized I remembered, oh gosh, I'm on with Tom, and I've got on bright orange and this wild necklace from Peru that was given to me and these crazy earrings. And it's a little funky. But then I said, you know, but that's really me. There's this part of me that is, is you know, classic and can do the pinstripe if I have to. But more than that, I'm the artsy, creative, colorful person who is bold and excited and passionate about life. And so you'll never see me in a pastel. You won't. And I look yeah. like shit in pastels yeah. too. I look awful. If you put me in yellow, I look like I'm dead. Um, but orange, you know, it says something. Plus it's one of our energy center colors that is all yeah. about creativity. Yeah. So yeah. I think, you know, to imagine you all that even the car you drive says worlds about who you are. In yeah. when you are a solopreneur or in small business, even to bring the internal and marry it to the external presentation is when you really become congruent. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. 
Now you're tapping into something really interesting, which, you know, design, the concept of design and people hear that they think, oh, either graphic design or interior design, mm -hmm. but design being the intent put into something, you know, design is the reason the iPhone feels like walking into the Apple store feels like, you know, the touch of the, uh, Apple watch on your skin. It's that consistency, that coherency, um, and I love your example of, you know, clothing, the clothing you choose to wear. I did a rebrand for a, a technology provider in uh, Syracuse, New York, about 15 years ago. And after we did the research, we came to them and new logo, new, new colorway, which is just basically the colors they use. But one of the main colors we recommended was this deep royal purple. So I always mm. remember presenting this to this, you know, boardroom <laughs> of, you know, you know, white middle-aged men in suits, you know, and, and showing them this and they kind of raised an eyebrow. But then we said, look, you know, we did the research. We looked at your competition. We looked at your marketplace. Mm -hmm. No one else is using this. So if you go to your next trade show, advertise in your next publication, you'll stand out. And they chose that. And you know, we had a supplementary secondary color palette that was equally robust and out there. And they saw it, you know, they were later acquired a few years down the road by a much larger provider and they you know, functionally, it made them stand out. And there was a reason and rationale behind it, you know, and as a commercial, when I put on my commercial graphic design hat, I know that I need to have that basis behind it. It's not like, oh, we didn't just use this color because, you know, it, it looked good. Or we didn't just use this. Somebody of, liked you know. it. <laughs> you told us. Yeah, I know. You told us you wanted to be seen as a financial it. services provider. You want to be seen as stable, confident, measured. You know, yeah. these colors, these images, this font convey that. Um, and that's what a good... Uh, strategic identity designer, graphic designer can do. They can draw that yeah. line between, oh, here's who you are. Here's who you aspire to be as an individual coach, as an organization. Here's the prescriptive uh, photos, images, presentation to do that. Um, and I love that you brought up Nike. You know, I've done some work with them. We did, you know, we oh. updated their guidelines around retail a few years ago. And I kid you not, it was a printed binder that thick. It just wow. photos because it was so prescriptive. It was like, you will choose this yeah. type of talent. You will light it this way. You will capture it from this angle. Yes. You will put this type of treatment on it. And that's why consistency. And that's why when you see a Nike produced photo, you know, that is a yeah. Nike photo. Like it just looks, we don't have to see the swoosh. Really, you almost can't name it. It just has that feel, that feel that is Nike. It has Nikiness. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and that takes a lot of effort and a lot of work. It doesn't just magically happen. It doesn't fall off the back of the turnip truck. It's strategic. It many, many people put lots of energy into doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's very strategic. Um, I have to say something. Okay. Now look, can we yeah. blow everybody's mind a little bit? Is that okay? Let's, can we do this? Let's do it. Let's all do right. It. So when you're it. talking about color, all right. So y'all mm -hmm. can see a little bit of the colors in my home. I have two large home offices that I'm in one of them, but I have bright colors all over my house. Right. My, and I have people come to my house regularly for workshops. Sometimes they, we do it, our work on zoom. Sometimes they come in person, but every color has a vibration. Now we know this from physics. Think about that. Every color has a vibration and every color, if you study color theory, every color creates a physiological effect in the body. So I want you all to think about it. Fast food restaurants, what are the colors that they use typically? Red, yellow, orange. Think about it. Those are the ones, red, yellow, orange. Why? Why do they use them? Because when you walk into McDonald's and you get in there, you're going to get out of there fast because it creates a physiological frenetic kind of or just pumps your blood faster. They're physiological things that happen to you in that red, yellow and uh, orange environment that say, you got to get out of here, eat and go, which means what? They can have more turnover, which means what? They can have more business. Now think about it, you all. Uh, when you go into a nursing home, right? What color do you see? Not red, yellow, and orange. You see pale green. You see pale blue. If you ever go into a mental institution to visit someone, maybe I hope you don't go there for yourself, but if you need to go, let me just say, just go. Um, if you need to, not a shame in that. But always it's those calming colors, those greens and those blues, because the physiological effect is it brings the heart rate down, it slows the respiration, and it creates a feeling of calm. So mm. think about this with your brand. 
And certain colors are associated. I know the color burgundy. I love the color burgundy. It's in my it's in my branding colors. I have like a burgundy and a salmon. So I'm really not off my branding colors. This is just like a brighter version of it. And mm -hmm. a royal blue. Those are my branding colors. The salmon brings in a more feminine feel because even though I work with men, I do work more with women overall. Mm -hmm. And the burgundy that I was attracted to, guess what? Studies show that the most highly educated people resonate with burgundy. All right. Mm -hmm. Now you can find this, yeah. you all, you could go on the web and yeah. read studies, yeah. make sure you have a good, you know, good source. So everything you are basically, when you have a business, when you embody your values in a business, what you're doing is translating what's inside of you in a way that somebody could see the outside and say, Oh, I get it. And I like that. And they could also say, I get it. And mm, she's not for me. She cussed. She said shit four times during this interview. Oh my God. How could she do that? She's a woman. She should not curse. And, you know, those people are not my people, right? My people are the ones who are going to just speak it like it is. We're going to, we're not going to hold back and we're not going to kowtow. So I wanted to say that, Tom. Every color has a vibration. What are the vibrations you're putting out there? This is physics, you all. This is nothing woo woo at all. Yeah. Yeah. And you're seeing the power of layering story on top of it, right? I mean, maybe mm -hmm. you just love that color, but diving into it, you know, you can, you can add science, you can add a bigger narrative to mm -hmm. it where it becomes a chance to tell story. You know, it, it, it allows you to, you know, as you're, if you're a coach working with a client, maybe that's a sideline example you provide, you mm -hmm. know, and maybe it becomes part of, you know, your narrative that you get to build around you. Um, I, you can search for it online, but it's, if, if anyone there's stuff like this, there is a little bit of mystique layered on, but one of the best documents out there, I forget the agency that produced it, but when they read redid the, um, the Pepsi logo, this was about 15 years ago to the new sort of, if you think at it, it's almost like a swooping triangle. Um, mm -hmm. there's a document, you can find it online. It's like a hundred pages long of the very specific intention behind that swoop where mm -hmm. it's a smile. It's the wind in the sails of change. It's all mm -hmm. these things. And it is a little bit, there is for the rational part of my brain, you can look at it and say, well, there's a large <laughs> element of that that is potentially hokum, but you know, it's who are who are we to judge someone else's story? You know, if it is true to, I mean, that's a large mega corporate brand. We can bring it down to the personal level. Who are we to say, you know, I can't, I can't talk down on your choice of, of color wearing. If that is what it evokes in you and there's the science, as we've seen, you know, wavelengths and you say, well, this is the wavelength that I want to put out into the world. And functionally when I'm yeah. diving into and coaching, you know, high performing executive, this color serves me well. It does what I need it to do. It creates that openness. It brings out, you know, your, your sunny spirit where, you know, it, it shows that, you know, I'm not afraid as I know you're not, Dr. Barnsley to go first <laughs> and say the hard thing. You know, yeah. that's so much of, so much of coaching is being willing to, you know, to fall down first Speak and it. say, yes, I mean, it's, it's tough you know, love. giving, giving permission. You know, giving permission by yeah. going first, right? I mean, I, I've been around coaches long enough to know mm -hmm. that, that is that is a superpower if you're willing to do it. It is a superpower. And actually to 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 tie that to why you give people what you give them. All right. So you know that I've had a couple of things going on in my personal life, which I'm not going to share here, but let's just say you all, we all have things that happen with family members where we may get pulled away from our business for a while. Well, yesterday when I was meeting with my Make It Happen Mastermind, I had a great um, joy in sharing with them. I said, now you all know, because I shared with them what was going on and that I would not be quite as available as I usually am. And I said, and here's the thing. I want you to know, I want you to guess how much I made last month in my business. So they're putting stuff up in the chat, right? And I said, somebody's going to win a prize, right? And I said, are you sure you want to stick with that 5K? Really? Are you sure you want to stick with that 10K? Really? Are you sure you want to stick with that 8K? And as it turns out, I was able to show them that what I had made was possible. I said, why was it possible for me to still make what I make while I was pulled away? Let's talk mm -hmm. about that. And we got into the most interesting discussion um, of... Yeah. 
the fact that the seeds that we sow consistently can reap a harvest even when we're, our attention is not there. And this is true. The brand will carry it when we can't. The brand will carry something for a little while when we can't. And we had this great discussion of it. So I just wanted to share that. And, you know, Tom, I was thinking about when you were talking about differentiation, I was thinking about how very important that is in business. You were talking about the purple color, right, which is really business differentiation. They come in, they have this this I'm guessing they had pretty boring colors that were, you know, beiges and blacks and whites in this. I'm just guessing. Not and too to come far, in not too far away. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gray, right. Right. A grays. And here to come in with a deep purple, that's differentiation at its best, as long as it has to do with the values of the, the exactly. you know, maybe the, the company loves to teach it, uh, to treat its customers like royalty. And there's a, there's a meaning in the, the, the purple that way, or maybe there's another meaning in it. But differentiation is so important. And I want to tell a quick story. I was invited by someone, a corporate exec, to come speak to the to FANG, which is the, the Financial Executives Networking Group. All right. And Tom, I thought, now I really liked this person who invited me. All right. We were probably as different as we could be politically, but our values were very much the same. The way that we approached parenting and some other things was very similar. So we bonded there. And when he invited me, I thought, wow, this is going to be really interesting. This is really not my best group. I had a lot of judgments. You know, it's mostly men. There might be one or two women there. And what do I have to say to financial executives? I don't, you know, there were a lot of things that went on and, and I got myself in this really kind of bad space about it. And then when I went to get dressed, Tom, I pulled out the pinstripes that I still had in my closet. They still fit. That was good. And I pulled them out and I thought, okay, this is probably what I should wear. And then I had this moment. Um, I had this moment of reckoning. And I said, Barnsley, Dr. Bonsley, Dr. Bonsley, you are not wearing this. You mm -hmm. are wearing what you love. So I put on this really interesting, very expensive black uh, coat that had embroidered flowers up and down the sides. And it was just unusual. It was very classy, but it, it was one of a kind. And I wore that. And I also, Tom, I did not do lecture format. I had these guys get up and do improv comedy, improvisational work as I taught them about the secrets to savvy networking. And yeah. it was a hit. They told me later there were only two women in this huge packed room. There was nowhere to sit. Actually, there were no seats left. They told me yours was our favorite presentation all year. We <laughs> loved your presentation. Now, now, why did they love it? I'd love to say it's my shining wit, my charm, blah, blah, blah. It was so very different. Plus, I really stood in my power. And my power is getting people to get up and experience, have a learning experience, and to get every voice to speak. That is my power in presentations and facilitation. Yeah. Even yeah. when I did <clears throat> a keynote for 1500, Tom, I had them making beautiful paper airplanes and they had to throw the airplanes with something written inside and have an accountability partner <laughs> in a a convention center with 1,500 people present. And I got a standing ovation, but I stood yeah. in my power. So I really want to say to everyone listening, you've got to really come to a moment of reckoning with yourself and ask yourself, what feels true to you? What feels true to you? And I wanted to ask you, Tom, when you spoke to those people in that boardroom about the purple, what were you wearing out of curiosity? Mm. Oh man. That, Do you remember? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't even tell you. I it was so long ago. Um, but I you brought up something really interesting and in my, you know, in, in the realm of marketing, positioning. So figuring yes. out where you fit, you know, the marketplace is is crowded, will always be crowded. It's flooded. There's a lot of other yeah. competition. Um, yeah. So being able to say, okay, this is where you know, one of the exercises I enjoy doing is okay, let's let's 
make an XY plot. Let's figure out where you fit on this. You know, let's pick, yeah. pick a factor to represent each of those axes. And then who are you, you know, closest to, you know, if, you know, who are you in competition yeah. with and let's figure out where, oh. where you fit. And the other thing, you know, you mentioned going to that event, figuring out what you're going to wear. We each, you know, by nature of just, you know, the container in which this soul is wandering around in, we come to a room yeah. with certain, you know, we will be perceived before we even open our mouth. You know, I mean, we'll be perceived in a certain way. Yeah. And the power of working against that, you know, whether, you know, there are certain cultural conceptions. Humans are stereotyping machines. It's not good or bad. It's just our brains need to preserve glycogen. So we like putting things in boxes and it's just yeah. what we're wired for. So when we meet someone, you know, we're kind of anxious, you know, until, you know, we can say, okay, oh, I can file them away here. Um, it's something we can train and grow our ability to be more flexible around filing people. Uh, but your story was really fascinating in that, you know, you showed the power of going against standards, going against dynamics. Um, where you and I are in very expectations. You and I are in very different regions of the country. You know, me being on the West Coast, you being more mm -hmm. in the, the Southeast. Coast. So yeah. that has a certain conveyance, you know, uh, and and changes the room into which you can walk. Um, so all that to say, being aware of how we're received and, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, it can be difficult to read the label, you know, from inside the bottle. That's where having that trusted group of friends who are willing to speak mm -hmm. truth and say, Hey, you know, Dr. Brown, I see you like this, or, you know, this is, this is the way you come yeah. across and it's not good or bad. You just, it's information. It's you. It's so information I want to say you something use. about yeah. region that you brought up. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. This is really powerful. Okay. Now yeah. this is kind of funny. I've spoken for, a community in California for a long time, all throughout COVID, they had me coming in to speak to them over and over and over again. And from Santa Rosa, California, I just loved them. I never met them in person ever and in Oregon. But see, yeah. people will guess, they'll say, are you from New York? I am from North Carolina. Let me just be clear. I am from North Carolina, <laughs> but I do not. Now, in some ways, I might be a Southern woman because we do have a way that we can put it, put, we can, as my mother would say, you know, we can, we could say the thing. We can, we can put the nail on the head there, but there's yeah, a specific yeah. way she says it. Um, hmm. And we can use just one little turn of phrase like, bless your heart. And we've just brought somebody down to here. <laughs> you, know, you just put it at the beginning or at the end of the sentence. And then you can say what other bad, any bad thing you want to say in between. Like, bless his yeah. heart. Did you see he was drunk at church? Or, oh, she just yeah. is in her third marriage. Bless her heart. So I am very different from most, I would say, from most women in this area. And it's mm -hmm. no, it's no, since I began going and networking globally more, my friends are all over. They're in Chicago. They're in New York. They're in these different places. And now I'm seeing that those people really, in general, get me better. They get me better yeah, yeah, than the people yeah. here in my area. There is power and, in strategic yeah. transgression, knowing how yes. you know, someone who looks like you would be received. And yeah, maybe you flip that on its head or you, you zig where everyone's like, oh, she's going to zag. But and that can literally become. Yeah, that becomes how you're known. That becomes your hook. That makes you stand out, you know, from the from the crowd. So I have a very firm faith. And I actually speak for churches a lot. I don't curse when I do that, Tom, by the way. But I speak for churches and spiritual communities a lot. That's part of who I am. And I don't have any problem dropping an F-bomb if need be when it, it it's it's the way something needs to be expressed because it so can't be made churches, nice. If you nice. drop an F-bomb in church, you will have an effect, I, I, I assume. Oh, uh, well, you would have an effect. You'd be, you know, you would be uh, probably taken out and, you know, buried alive or whatever. You'd be crucified. Let's put it that way. But the point is we can hold, we can hold what appears to be, I love your, your term strand, strategic transgression. We can, we can kind of toe the line on one thing because I very much believe in faith, but it's a very, it's more a mystical faith that I have. And we can connect with people there. But then we can be over here and we can be like Tony Robbins and use the F-bomb to get people out of their comfort zone. So we can do mm -hmm. both. We can hold this duality. And so I would say to people, it's never just as simple as a transgression, 
you know, there are gradations happening there because in some ways you are finding a point of intersection with other people, with your ideal clients, with your JV yeah. partners, with your affiliates. You're finding that point of intersection. But then in other ways, you're differentiating yourself based on your locus yeah. of value. And yeah. both are necessary, yeah. right? We need both. I have this. I have this vision of your core unchanging. You know, there is, there is mm -hmm. an element of you that will never be transgressed, but outside of that, and you think of layers of an onion mm -hmm. or, you know, an M and M with a center, that's a little more fungible. Like it, it'll work, it'll adapt. And that makes you and any, any coach, any consultant, anyone in life better able to walk into more, more situations, more rooms, more. And wouldn't this mm -hmm. world be a little bit better place if, you know, maybe we, found ourselves in rooms that were, you know, widely, widely varying, different perspectives, different thoughts. Um, yeah, I think we could all probably stand to be a little more malleable. Well, you know what, Tom? Compromising on those core nuggets. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's something people say to me a lot. And I really mm -hmm. take it as such a compliment. They say, you know, because I've spoken to, to um, audiences where I was the only quote unquote, and I don't even believe in this because it's a construct, white person, right? and was loved. I've spoken to all Latino audiences and was loved. I have traveled widely in many countries and always felt at home. But I realize, and this is when we go back to my fundamental value, that you matter. Every voice yeah. matters. That when you strip away the skin, underneath we're all the same. And hmm. to take us back to what we were talking about earlier about pain, and transmuting your pain into power and into a purpose for your life and for your business. When you sit down and talk with somebody, I mean, really talk and excavate and really get present listening, listening, not thinking about what am I going to say, but really listening. You will find that every person has some sort of, because it is part of who we are on this planet. And when we can come into, and, and coaching, by the way, is about that kind of listening. There is yeah. a part of coaching that is really listening and then mirroring back what we hear. And then there's a part of coaching that's excavating what someone may not even know is there. That's, I always call it the blind spot. We all have them. But having mm -hmm. someone who can excavate that out so suddenly we can see this thing and say, oh my God. I never realized it. That's been here all along. There's this part, there's this kind of mystical, sacred aspect to this opportunity to coach people that I just love. And actually, I love sales and enrollment conversations. I call them enrollment, Tom, because I get to ask the questions to really understand why someone is the way they are and what really matters yeah. to them. Yeah. You know, and there's nothing better than that. Mm -hmm. So good. Nothing better Gosh, in life. We, and you get to ask it to the companies. Well, you the get power to ask of bonding it over. Yeah. The power of good questions and the power. Yes. Of, I love what you said around just bonding over shared, you know, human existential pain. I mean, that is, yeah. you know, transmuting. Yeah. I hear what I hear is just the power of transmuting in the company of other people, you know, and that's, yes. you know, if I had to bring this in for a landing and like, okay, what is the, what is the TLDR? What's the one takeaway? If you're going to transmute past pain and do purpose in your life for whatever, do it in the company of others, you know, people you trust, people who love you, people who will be able to hold up the mirror and, and show you what you can't see because you're behind your eyeballs. Um, yeah. No, oh, that's, that's so good. Um, I got to add one more thing, Tom, I know we're wrapping. Do it. And that it, is it. not only that, do it in the, in the context of people, obviously, so you have support, but the other people is, the other thing is you have a moral, I believe, moral imperative and obligation to bring your transmission of pain to others who are trying to do the same and they don't know how. And that is where you make a livelihood. And notice that the word live is in lively, livelihood because you come and you can say, I've gotten, I've walked over the coals. I've done this thing. Here's where I came from. Here's where I am. I see where you are. You're not going to stay there. You don't have to stay there. Here's how you can yeah. get here. Yeah. And that yeah. is when we become a person, a business owner, a soul, and a human body who leaves a legacy that outlives this human form.
Yeah, yeah. I can't add anything to that. Man, we got um, deep, Tom. Man, I know. That's, that's, <laughs> I love it. Your website's up there. Um, I know if, if people want to connect with you or and you have some some from some stuff that can be downloaded there. Um, yes, anything else, I got anything, ebook. Anything Go get the ebook. Out? Yeah, get the ebook. Um, yes, you all right there. Make sure you put the dash spirited solutions.com and you can grab your free copy, a complimentary copy of how to overcome overwhelm and seven easy steps. And very soon I'm going to have another special offer for you there. And once you get into my email list, you will find out about the complimentary webinar online workshop that I mentioned earlier, which is on the five action, the five little known action stoppers that are destroying your business. All right. And I just want to say to everybody listening, don't wait anymore. Waiting and hoping hoping are not strategies to be the biggest you, to be, to have the biggest presence in your business that you are put here to have. Waiting and hoping are not strategies. And so having yourself stuck is not an option. And getting yourself unstuck is what I love to do. So good, man. Authority is earned. And, you know, Dr. Barnes, you are an authority in this space. And it's only because you put in the hard work to, you know, you know, do do the work. And that is why yeah. you speak from a position of authority as a coach. So, so glad we could sit down and, and unpack this today. Hopefully, you know, people tuning in either now down the road to find it useful. But um, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate you and just being in counting you as a, as a friend in the network of uh, fellow travelers and, you know, just trying to make this journey of life. I appreciate you, Tom. And I know that uh, those who've tuned in, we, we just are affirming that you're taking away something that that inspires you to more action, to be as one person I heard say this week, to be an actionist and not just a hoper and a dreamer. Hmm. Love it. All right. We'll end it there.